Good morning, Christina. So here we are in our third office hours uh, of the semester, and what are the questions that have been coming up? Yeah, so the first three questions that we, we received are conceptual, and this is because students were wondering about uh, clarifying different concepts for the, for the papers that are due on Sunday. Uh, so the first one is on Hirschman's theory on exit voice and loyalty, and whether you could, again, go over um, that theory a little bit. Sure. So Hirschman's book uh, was famous because it was the first uh, analytically precise and insightful treatment of how organizations respond to decline. And he's, he had these three categories, exit, voice, and loyalty. Exit and voice are to some extent um, uh, simpler to understand in that they, there's something of a trade-off between them. So if you think about if you own shares in a company um, that, and you don't like what they're doing, you can either go to shareholders' meetings and complain uh, and try and get them to change their practices, or you can just sell your shares in that company and buy uh, shares in some other company that's run in a way that you prefer. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, there's a trade-off between exit and voice. And in a case like that, um, Obviously, if you, if you don't have any particular emotional ties to the firm or anything like that, it's just much easier uh, to exit rather than spend the time and so on on voice. Um, however, if you do have some commitment to the firm, then you might view things differently than if you know, maybe it was started by your family before it went public and you, you got a commitment and you wanted to see it do the right thing. Um, or your university is investing it in the firm as part of its endowment. You might you might have reasons to to exercise voice, but then you are choosing to bear the costs of participation in order to get something done for, for those sorts of reasons. But another reason that the the exit voice um, alternatives are worth attending to, particularly when you're thinking about politics is that they often encapsulate the power dynamics within organizations. So again, if you think about a firm, um, uh, yes, shareholders can easily exit, mm -hmm. um, but employees might not be able to because their costs of getting up and moving are very high. You've got to relocate your family. You've got to get another job. There might not be another job and so on. And so for an employee, Voice might be really important you, if you're unhappy with the way management is treating you um, and so on. And so often um, trying to understand the power dynamics within an organization, what we look at is differential capacities for exit. And we mm -hmm. talked about some of that uh, with respect to, for example, um, the provision of Medicaid. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about that earlier in the course, that if the people who who making decisions about how much to spend on Medicaid are not going to actually use Medicaid, then mm -hmm. they have uh, you know, uh, very different stakes. Loyalty is a more complicated notion because mm -hmm. on the one hand, if you have a lot of loyalty to an organization, they have good reasons to listen to you because they know you care about it, they know you want to make it better, um, and so your, your complaints about what's going on should be taken seriously. On the other hand, if, if you're known to be loyal to an organization, you don't have a credible threat to exit mm -hmm. because they'll say, well, he'll never go anywhere. He's, he's, right. he's a lifer. Mm -hmm. um, and so Hirschman's treatment of loyalty is much subtler for those reasons and doesn't offer clear um, trade-offs in the way mm -hmm. exit and voice do. Thank you. And a student was wondering whether this theory only applies to the elite but it, it clearly doesn't from the examples Absolutely that you've mentioned. Absolutely not. Yeah, it applies to anybody. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So the second conceptual question is on your lecture on privatization and of the military and prisons. And I know you said that this isn't really privatization, but actually a contracting out of a government monopoly. And you use Weber's uh, uh, definition of the state. Um, so students were wondering whether you could go over again what Weber's definition is and how it applies here in this case. Yeah, so the Weber defined a state as, as exercising a, a monopoly on the legitimate use of coercive force within a given territory. Um, and uh, 
that sort of flows out of the idea that goes all the way back to Hobbes, that power is a natural monopoly. And if you don't have it exercised as a monopoly, you get civil war. Um, and so you get competing militias fighting for control. We're going to be talking about Lebanon uh, after October break. Um, Lebanon uh, and Libya, both um, Lebanon in the 80s and Libya um, since 2011, both instances where you have a breakdown of the monopoly of coercive force and it results in civil war. So that's the notion of, a, of a mono, uh, the state, in order to be effective, has to be able to exercise a monopoly of coercive force. And when we talk about failed states, we, we're essentially talking about states where that monopoly is incomplete right. or, or seriously uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. um, what I was saying about um, uh, privatization of prisons in the military is actually a somewhat different point, which is that um, people talk about it as privatization, but really what they're, they're not privatizing ultimately the decisions to lock people up or the decisions mm -hmm. to fight or not fight wars. Those remain decisions of the government. Mm -hmm. um, and so the government is contracting out um, the implementation of those decisions. So, mm -hmm. so the government remains the principal um, and the contracted out activity is done by the agents. Mm -hmm. But that's different from a government selling off British Rail, say, mm -hmm. or selling off council houses to tenants as the Thatcher government did in the 1980s, then your government's just getting out of the business of an activity altogether and turning it over to the private sector. That's what most people have in mind mm -hmm. when we talk about privatization. And that is not what we're doing when we're so-called privatizing the military and prisons. Right. Thank you. So the third question then is on your lecture on South Africa. And I know you talk about the key group of, of certain uh, businesses in South Africa that were able to overcome a collective action problem and you said that they were okay with with others free riding on kind of their their collective action and, and their steps. Right so this this idea of a K group we we owe to a political theorist by the name of Russell Hardin not mm -hmm. to be confused with Garrett Hardin mm -hmm. who's famous for the tragedy of the commons which mm -hmm. is another collective action problem. Uh, perhaps better known than the K-group idea. But the notion of a K-group is that um, uh, when you have a collective action problem, the, the, the nature of the problem is that nobody's got an interest in providing or contributing to the provision of a collective good because they know others will free ride on it if they do. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the rational thing to do is essentially uh, not provide it, not participate in its provision. And so for the game theorists in the, in the room, this is, this is the <laughs> prisoner's dilemma writ large. Um, and so what, what the idea of a K group is, well, if you have a small number of players that um, dominate uh, a market, if they can get together and solve their collective action problems, maybe they know each other, they, they mm -hmm. have ways of building trust among one another. Um, the, to put it in the language of economists, the surplus that is generated will be big enough mm -hmm. that it'll still be worth it to them to, to provide the collective good, even knowing that the little players are going to free ride. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the story when Mike Spicer said you could get nine people in a, around a table uh, and you had basically the whole South African economy or the commanding heights of the South African economy. If those nine people could mm -hmm. decide to provide a collective good, namely uh, support the transition to a democratic order and, and bear the costs of doing that, fighting it out in shareholders meetings, uh, dealing with recalcitrant um, uh, employees, and maybe uh, sh uh, you know, some of the subsidiaries who didn't want to go along. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, this uh, wasn't easy. But if, if they decided you know, they can do it, um, the benefits are going to be so great that even though there will be some uh, 
some free riding by the, the other smaller players, it's still worth it to them. So mm -hmm. that's the notion of a K group. Okay. Great, thank you. So the next few questions are on South Africa's transition. And the first one is on thinking about this uneasy alliance between the IFP and the Afrikaner right wing. And how do we tell the difference between sort of interest-based divided dollar strategies versus ideal-based ethnic self-rule approaches? Because here, these two dimensions seem to somewhat overlap. And how do we pull them apart and make sense of, of the strange coalition? So that's a hugely interesting question. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes, they, they do overlap. Mm -hmm. um, and they might live in uh, less tension with one another when they're part of a blocking coalition than when they're in part of an, an enabling co coalition. So for example, what Nkacha and the, and the, um, the right-wing whites shared in common uh, was that they had, for part of a blocking coalition, they wanted to stop the transition. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't mean that they really agreed on what they did want afterwards. Um, and indeed, uh, had you know, had there been a partition that that ultimately satisfied Inkata, it wouldn't necessarily have satisfied the right wing, uh, the the right wing white uh, separatists. They, they, their their demands changed over time because first they thought they could stop the transition completely. Um, then, uh, when it became clear after Boputaswana that the military was behind the transition and they weren't mm -hmm. going to stop it, they started talking about carving out a white homeland. Uh, it wasn't clear where it was going to be. So they didn't know what they were. So in other words, it, you, the, the, the effect of blocking coalition may not be an effect of enabling coalition. Mm -hmm. The place we see this um, also is in, in the Brexit uh, mm -hmm debate that the blocking coalition is not an enabling coalition. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, part of the Brexit constituency is far right uh, conservatives who want, um, you know, they want Singapore on the Thames. They want a, a hard charging um, pro, pro market uh, policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then on the left wing of the Labour Party, they really want socialism in one country. They mm -hmm. want uh, they want to be able to have a more status agenda than you mm -hmm. can can achieve in Europe. And so uh, uh, we and we also saw this in in Greek opposition to to the EU, the far mm -hmm. left and the far right. They they're opposed to the EU, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. So, but they're not in favor of the same thing. So, blocking coalitions and enabling coalitions are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And enabling coalitions uh, involving identity politics are hard to hold together because it tends to not be divisible goods, and mm -hmm. so they can't make deals and compromises. Um, right. So it's harder to do things than to stop things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so let's talk about the ANC for a bit. Um, initially, the ANC had demands for socialism, but they dropped them along the way. And is this decision best understood as a pragmatic shift, kind of for the sake of, of reaching the end of apartheid? Um, or was it more of a genuine shift in political uh, economic ideals and maybe also the leaders of the ANC thinking that they could be part of some capitalist elite and then benefit from 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 these, these new realities? So that was also an excellent question. And the answer is it wasn't the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it was some of both, uh, differently in different uh, constituencies. I think that at the time, um, it, you know, we, we were still, we're talking about what I've been in the course calling the early post-Cold War up through the financial crisis of 2008. And this is when the this is when the um, Washington consensus was ascendant, and surely it was true that many white business elites were firm believers in the Washington consensus and, and wanted South Africa to be able to participate for the BRIC to become the BRICS, as it ultimately did. Mm -hmm. um, and so they believed in that as a matter of ideology. What I think 
uh, is more complicated is the part, the part you're posing. Why, why did the ANC um, go so, you know, so quickly abandon its uh, RDP and get mm. uh, embrace this program called GEAR, which was a standard right. neoliberal um, Washington consensus diet. Um, so some of it was that, that they were persuaded. Um, at least, you know, some of the some of the ANC economic elites were persuaded, and also it, it is the case that that while particularly the the ANC who had been in prison had tended to be um, on Robben Island for for decades and so on, they had tended to have more ossified views. The the ones that had been in exile had been influenced by a, a whole. Um, range a lot of a whole range of opinions outside in the world. They weren't isolated in the same way. So, and somebody like Mbeki, we saw when he ultimately became um, president, that he was very much a technocrat uh, in the Western mold. But I think that the it it is fair to say that at the time, many people underestimated the connections between the ANC and big business. And I can give you a little anecdote about this um, that I didn't draw the right conclusions from at the time, but in retrospect, um, I, I can tell that uh, I, mi I missed something important. So in the course of the transition, the, those years between 1991 and, and, and uh, 1992, um, when the uh, terms of the deal were being hammered out, some in, sometimes in these public forums and sometimes in, in secret, um, as, as I discussed in the lecture, they started having um, a series of meetings of academics and um, po politicians, political party mm -hmm. people. And uh, a lot of, uh, they had a lot of them, and I went to one or two of them. Mm -hmm. And there was, they were being facilitated by an, a group called IDASA, which no longer exists, Institute for Democratic South Africa kind of think tank. And I can remember this one meeting, um, which was going to be on party finance and, um, and political parties more generally, in, that IDASA held in Pretoria, and I was one of the academics present. And um, it was one of these situations where you're only going to be able to say one thing. You know, the, the, all the political parties, and there were five or six of the parties then, and this was before the elections, so even the small parties were treated with more seriousness, or what would become the small parties were treated with more seriousness than they might have been <laughs> after the elections. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, when, when it came to my turn, I said, well, I think the most important thing is that parties need to divulge where they get their funding um, for reasons that you might glean from the lecture on uh, money and politics that we gave in the US context. And we went around the room, and everybody s said this was unexceptionable. The National Party people, even the uh, the the, the, the various right-wing parties, mm -hmm. uh, even the um, Pan-Africanist Congress people who, you know, their slogan was one settler, one bullet. They were on the far left um, of the militant uh, side of the liberation. They all said, fine. It came to the ANC and the person blew up, went mm -hmm. berserk and said, this is, um, this is trying to recreate the power of um, the white elites and, and so forth. So it didn't really make any sense. And I was puzzled by it, but I think that sub subsequently what I missed uh, was that the ANC did not want to know, what did not want it known how much they were being funded by white big business. Mm -hmm. Even back then, I think they were getting a lot of um, financial support uh, mm -hmm. at the time and they didn't want to have to divulge that. And so the, the critics of the, uh, and I think it's sort of em emblematic that the critics of what was ultimately negotiated uh, think that, that um, you know, the w white South Africans got the deal, the white elites got the deal that they wanted because they were able to stay in their fancy houses with their servants and so on, and mm -hmm. essentially their privatized police forces in their gated <laughs> communities, and the quid pro quo was uh, the creation of 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 a black 
uh, elite, but not much other transformation of the economy, or certainly not as much as people were anticipating at the time. And that, mm -hmm. that little meeting about party funding, in <laughs> retrospect, I realize, uh, really encapsulated mm -hmm. the, the, the issue. That's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know we talked in detail about the importance of luck, leadership, and legitimacy yeah. in South Africa's transition. Yeah. And you use the case of Israel and Palestine to kind of look at how these three factors are absent. And students were wondering whether you could also talk about the Northern Ireland case on these three, three issues. Yes. So um, I, I mentioned Northern Ireland more briefly in the lecture, but... So if we, if we think about luck leadership and uh, legitimacy, they're, they're, they're all relevant. So uh, I think I, I, I said that when Jerry Adams emerged as the leader of the IRA, many people said, oh, this is a different kind of leader. Um, he walks around in a suit and tie and he talks like a, a regular politician. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could, this is, this is you know, in the 1980s, maybe there could be a settlement uh, now, but they couldn't for luck reasons, for contingency reasons, and the, the main one was that the the Conservative Party in Westminster was dependent upon uh, the 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 Unionist vote in Northern Ireland for its majority. So, um, you know, far from the status quo being a wasting asset, the st the status quo was indispensable to the government in power. There was no question that um, there was absolutely no question that there wasn't going to be any real change in uh, Britain's dealing with the IRA uh, while you have a conservative government. It, in fact, you know, they used to be called the Conservative and Unionist Party, mm -hmm. um, dependent on Northern Ireland for its majority. 1997, Tony Blair wins. The Labour Party is not dependent. So, that, so then uh, the contingency things have changed. Then it matters whether there's a leader or that is willing to negotiate and make, uh, make a settlement. And in, in this case, they eventually uh, reached the Good Friday Agreement, which is a, you know, at least a, a partial settlement. Um, how much legitimacy has it had? It's a tough call, and, and legitimacy is a much more difficult thing to measure. Um, I like to think of the, the definition of legitimacy as um, you, you know a, a circumstance is legitimate if people could violate it and violate the rules and get mm -hmm. away with it, but they choose not to. So mm -hmm. they accept that there's something right about the rules, legitimate about the rules, that, that they, should, they should obey even though they could get away with not obeying. Um, and <coughs> it's, it's very difficult to study that empirically. I mean, for example, most of the, uh, if you look at the violence in Northern Ireland, uh, my impressionistic sense, I haven't gone over the data with a fine tooth comb, is that the, the main thing that's actually affected violence in Northern Ireland has been the, the health of the Southern Irish economy. And so in the run-up to the financial crisis when everybody was talking about the Celtic tiger and you know the Irish economy uh, was the best performing economy in Europe um, mm -hmm. in, in the run-up to the financial crash. And um, the violence in the North went to zero for practical purposes. And, you know, um, one possible interpretation of that is that the, the, the um, Northern Irish Protestants started to think, you know, in, in eventual reunification with this, this, you know, juggernaut thriving economy wouldn't be so bad. Mm -hmm. and, and after the collapse, actually, the violence uh, started to come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are now uh, a number of people who think that if, uh, if the Brexit occurs in a way that um, uh, does not keep Ireland uh, both in, with a no, no border to, to the UK and in the, in the EU, the violence will increase. So it may not have very little 
the incidence of violence may have very little to do with the, the, the concept of legitimacy and there might be a more materialist or interest-based explanation. And it's hard to study because the two are observationally equivalent. Right. Thank you. So our last question on South Africa's transition is one on mediation. And you mentioned that Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington <coughs> uh, tried to mediate the conflict, but they failed. And so students were wondering, under what conditions is mediation a useful tool? And can you point us towards any success cases in history? So I think it's mostly mediation can only work if all the elements of an agreement are present. And, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a misdescription of what happened with the Carrington Kissinger Commission. Um, it, it was really the, the, the consultative business movement people uh, who were of the view that they were very close to an agreement. And, and if, if, if only the talking could be facilitated by an outside group, might sort of, um, you know, break the ice and they could get, get to yes. And when they asked Kissinger and Carrington to come, they were very skeptical because I think to the outsiders, it didn't look like this, you know, as we saw from the, the lecture, uh, you know, Johannesburg was seething with violence and it um, uh, didn't look at all like it was close to an agreement. And uh, so when they came, they only, I think they stayed a day and a half. Uh, before they started packing up. They, they said, you know, they, I think they, they thought they had been deceived. Um, so it's not that they really tried, they just came and said, these people are so far apart, there's not gonna be a settlement and there's nothing we can do about it. And they packed up and left. Um, and I think for the most part, uh, outsiders are not going to, not going to actually be able to produce an agreement when it doesn't exist. Another example is when Bill Clinton in the summer of 2000 tried to get an agreement between um, Arafat and, and um, um, Barack. Uh, no, it wasn't Barack. Yeah, yeah well, it was Barack. Um, he got no and why because there was no support for it um, it, among uh, Palestinians or Israelis, and so you know, they they were saying, "Why can't you make this agreement? You were ready to make it five years ago." But the support had gone away, and there was nothing Clinton could do because Arafat knew he wouldn't survive a week in Palestinian politics at that point if he got behind the agreement. So, it's very difficult for outside players to to actually produce an agreement. I think what they can do is um, through mediation type processes, they can help build trust. So, um, you know, I talked about the, the consultative business movement uh, as trust building bet between the players in the country, but there were also um, parallel to that in London, a variety of meetings between ANC leaders and uh, the white political and business elites arranged through Consgold and, and some other companies in London to build trust to get them to the point where they could make an agreement. But at the end of the day, uh, unless the elements are there on the ground, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So our last question for today is on the ICC. And you mentioned that one critique about the ICC is that it is Eurocentric and has pro-Western biases. And students are wondering whether this critique can be best understood as an analysis of its ideals, its interests, or both. So, there's so it's for sure the, the idea behind the ICC was pressed as ideals and interests. Um, the, the champions of it saw, saw this as finally beginning to deliver on one of the promises for an international court of justice that wouldn't just be victors' justice after wars, as with the Nuremberg trials and so on, and other trials I mentioned in the in the um, lecture, and wouldn't just be ad hoc tribunals, but also for the incentive effects for people to know that uh, if if you engage in um, 
serious human rights violations while you're in power, uh, you can be held to account later. And so the, the idea was the incentive effects on the, on the future. Um, so even if it's a very small number of actual pro prosecutions, the knowledge that this could be you would temper your, your um, propensity to engage in human rights violations if you're in a position to do that. So that's, that was definitely I ideas, ideals that people had been talking about this in one form or another since 1919. And here it was finally uh, institutionalized. Um, how referrals are made depends because there's so many different ways in which referrals can be made to the ICC. Um, and particularly, as we saw, if you, if you think about uh, the critique of the U.S. for, for um, s voting to refer Gaddafi to the ICC in 2011, when the U.S. itself doesn't ex accept uh, ICC jurisdiction, this is, you know, clear, raw, interest-based um, uh, action on the part of, of um, in that case, the Obama administration. Now you could say, well, um, the Obama administration had been moving in a direction of cooperating with the ICC even though they didn't recognize it, um, but they had shown no sign of actually subjecting the U.S. to the ICC. Um, so in that sense, uh, there's so many different ways that people can be referred to the ICC that uh, you couldn't have an argument uh, one way or the other. I think, though, that the harder question about the ICC is whether it, in fact, creates the right incentives. Because um, I mentioned the case of Idi Amin. Part of the, this is back to Hirschman, part of the way it was negotiated that he would give up power and leave was that he was going to go and live out his days in Libya, as it turned out, um, in a house in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so if, if transitions are dependent on reducing exit costs and amnesty arrangements, the South African transition, people were promised there would be an amnesty um, possibility, which was, was subsequently uh, and institutionalized through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, that lives in obvious tension with um, the ICC's position that people are going to be held to account later. Um, and indeed, by the way, the, the, in order to get amnesty in the South African amnesty, um, TRC, one of the things you had to establish was that your actions were, came from a political motive. So, so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's not a, a tension, it's a flat out contradiction. And so I think that's the hardest question about the ICC that um, underscores a truth that we've seen in other contexts in this course that good things don't always go together. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. That's it for this week.